Although the Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell us the story of the birth of the baby Jesus, John tells us who, who he was before he became the baby Jesus and why he came into the world. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of that light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light which gave light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Pray with me this morning. As we examine this text with this thought in mind, the word became flesh. The word became flesh. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege and opportunity of standing before these our people. Lord, let, the, let them see less of me and more of thee. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Let the redeemer of the Lord say, Amen. Amen. This time of the year, we hear talk about getting the Christmas spirit. And I've often wondered why it is that people can find in their hearts just a little, to be just a little kinder to their fellow men around Christmas time when they're incapable of that during the rest of the year. I've often wondered why that was, and I have a theory. And I believe just turning our mind to Jesus allows the Spirit of God to draw us closer to God, and we're able to be a little more like Jesus around Christmas time. I believe that's the reason that Jesus came to the world, to draw us closer to God. I've preached in the past about the need that we all have to grow close to God. It's a need that we have whether we admit it or not. There is a gap between God and man because of sin. For ever since the Garden of Eden, the gap, of man, the gap between God and man has been wired and growing. God is grace and truth, light and life. When man, when man sinned, he embraced darkness and deceit, death and depravity. Throughout the ages, man's attempt to overcome these failings and to draw close to God have proven futile. Man was and is incapable of overcoming his sinful nature. He is defeated by the nature of his own flesh. Because of his sin, man is unable to partake the glory of God as God had created him to. But Christ came in human flesh and overcame the failings of the flesh by the power of the Spirit. And with his coming and his dying and his resurrection, he made it possible for us to overcome the fallen nature of our flesh by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus Christ came in the flesh, we're not able to take part in the glory of God. And the Apostle John, his writing, tells the story of God's love for us in Jesus Christ better, I believe, than any of the other sacred writers. But how does Jesus Christ coming in the flesh 2,000 years ago affect us today? How can his coming draw us closer to the glory of God? Well, the answer is in the text. So let's turn to the text so that we might hear and appreciate the, how the coming of Jesus Christ draws us closer to God. Turn to the text again, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of of men. Because Jesus came in human flesh, we are not able to receive life in abundance. Jesus came to bring life. He came to bring us life, a better life, a more joyful life, an abundant life. In fact, that's the way the Lord himself described the life that he brings. He calls it life in abundance. John 10, 10, he says, the thief only comes to rob and to steal and to kill. I have come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The life that the Lord is talking about is spiritual life. Life is communication with God. 
Death is separation from God. Now, death does not mean sleep. Death means, does not mean unconsciousness. Death means separation. Spiritual death means separation from God. Now, God told Adam and Eve if they ate of the forbidden fruit, they would die. They ate and they died spiritually. They were instantly separated from God. And after Adam sinned, God asked Adam, where are you at? It wasn't because God knew where Adam was. He asked that question so that Adam would be fully aware of his condition, that he was separation, that separated from God for the first time since his creation. Jesus came to bring life, to reconnect connect man to God, the source and supplier and sustainer of life. People who are separate from God have death wrapped all around their souls. Even though their bodies are still walking around like zombies, eating and sleeping and drinking, their souls are dead. All of us were in that state before we were saved. We could sense that something was missing from our existence, but we could not satisfy that longing, and we could not explain it. Many folks today will admit and say, I'm still missing something in my life, because I don't know what it is, but I, I don't know where to find it. Jesus says, here it is. I have it. I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I've come that they might have life, the connection with the eternal creed, life that communication with the divine comforter, life that peace that speaks to the depth of the soul and says, all is well. I have come that they might have life and have it in abundance. Life does not mean an end when these bodies return to the dust from which they came. Life that does not end as Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5 and 1. But we know that if this earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Jesus came to bring life. The world that we live in today celebrates death. In the, in the country where our young people glorify death in their games and in their music, pumping into their minds, through their ears and eyes continually. And yet we still act surprised and shocked when they kill without thinking and without remorse. The young people get the example from their elders. America should no longer claim to be a, a Christian nation because it is not. The soul of America is as pagan and as the Canaanites and the Moabites. The, they worship cold dead stones that could not save. America worships cold hard steel that cannot save and brings death with swiftness. And no matter how much death guns bring into our lives, America will not let go of its idolatry of guns. No matter how much death, America clings tightly to the sacred right to blow the neighbor to kingdom come. That's not Christian. That's not Christian. We have become a culture of death, so we must turn from the celebration of death to the celebration of life. Jesus came to bring life. When we look at the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, we see that he came to bring life, but that's not all we see. Let's look at the text again. Verse 4 again. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. Because Jesus came in human flesh, we're not able to receive light in the midst of darkness. Jesus came to bring light. The darkness of this world could not overpower the light. That's what the word comprehend means in this case. It means to overpower. Light always overpowers darkness. We can see that in the natural world. You shine a small light into a dark room, and no matter how small the light or how dark the room, you will still see the light. The darkness is overcome by the light. When you look out at the sky at night and see all those stars shining from a billion light years away, that means that all the darkness for the, those billions of miles had to get out of the way and allow that, dark, that light to come to you. Light overcomes darkness. And the light of Jesus Christ shined into this dark world, and the darkness could not overcome it. Darkness had to get out of the way. Since God is light, then everything that is not connected to him is in darkness. Therefore, this world is in darkness because it is separated from God. God sent heaven's brightest light to overcome the darkness of the world. But before Jesus came, God sent his witness. Look at verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Now, that's a good title, a man sent from God. John was born with one purpose, to point out the Messiah. Verse 7, this man came for a witness, to bear witness of that light that all through him might believe. God preserved for himself a witness. He always does, at least one or two or sometimes thousands. He was not that light, verse 8 said, but sent to bear witness of that light. 
The Pharisees asked John if he was the Messiah. He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. I'm just one to bear witness. Now, Jesus claimed that John is his witness. Jesus said to the Pharisees, I don't need any man for my witness because my father is my witness. But if you need an earthly witness of who I am, go talk to John. And he would testify to the truth. He has told you who I am. Jesus declared that there was no greater prophet that ever lived than John the Baptist. Now, you see, John the Baptist was not the first prophet of the New Testament. He was the last prophet of the Old Testament. John, in fact, represented the testimony of all the Old Testament prophets. They all pointed to the coming of the Messiah. But it was John was the greatest because he was given the opportunity to stand and declare, there he is, he has arrived. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. John was the greatest of the prophets because one day John stood up in the place of Moses, in the place of Isaiah, in the place of Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Elijah. He stood, representing all the prophets of Jehovah, and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John was great because he was giving that great testimony to me. John was testifying even before he was born. When he was still in the womb of his mother, Elizabeth, and Jesus was in the womb of Mary, the Bible said that John leaped for joy in his mother's womb when Mary came in the room bearing Jesus. He was not that way, but he was sent to bear witness of that way. He pointed the world to the one light that had the power to remove all darkness. That was a true light that gave light to every man coming to the world. Jesus came to the world to be light so that the darkness could be overcome. He came to be light so that you and I could find our way out of darkness. He came to be light so this lost world could find its way back to God. He came to be light so those with sin-blighted eyes could see the truth. In each of our lives, God has shown his light for the truth that he wants us to live out. Now, I don't know what God has shown you. I just know what he's shown me. Now, that light that has come to, that light's come that we each must answer God and walk in, in, in the light. Because Jesus brought the light from heaven into the world, we have no excuse for remaining in darkness. When we look at the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh, we see that he brings light. But even when the light came, there were some who refused to see. Look at verse John chapter 1, verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. He came to bring light to a world that did not realize it was living in darkness. He came to the crown of his creation, and his creation rejected him. He came to give the gift of life to all mankind, but mankind did not receive him. But to those who did receive him, he brought a gift that they could not purchase and that they did not deserve. He brought the gift of eternal life through adoption into the family of God. Now that's called grace, to receive a gift that you desperately need, that you don't deserve, and you cannot buy. That's God's amazing grace. The message that we just read said, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. If you've been given a, a right to become something, it means that, that you were not that before. Otherwise, the right you will receive has no meaning. But by the way we're born to God's family is totally different or separate from the way we're born to our earthly families. Flesh and blood, human will, and human desire have nothing to do with this, the, the new birth. It's totally of God. We cannot do it for ourselves or for our children. God has to do it. That's called grace. It's God's grace that draws us closer to God. Look at the text again in verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Because Jesus came in human flesh, we are now able to receive grace from our Father. Jesus came to bring grace into the world. Jesus came to the world to bring life, to bring light, and to bring grace to all who will receive him. Jesus put on human flesh so that we could receive the blessings of God. And even though he was covered with flesh, John testified that they were able to see his divine glory shining through that human flesh. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, a literal translation of that phrase means he pitched his tent with us. If you go back to the Greek and, and translate that, that phrase means he pitched his tent with us. 
He came from the holiness of heaven to the wilderness of the world. He pitched his tent among us. He was willing to come down here and to rough it with us. He came where we were, flesh and blood, so that we become what he is, sinless and glorified. He did all that and more. Look at the text again. Verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came in the flesh so that God's promises of old would become true. Uh, until Jesus came, the Old Testament phrase, mercy and truth, was just a promise. But it was a promise of God so that all his will trusted it. But when Jesus put on human flesh and stepped down into history, he became the fulfillment of the promises of God. And that's what he said to a group of self-righteous Bible scholars one day, the Pharisees. He said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. All the promises of, of the grace and the mercy of God are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He came to make all those promises true. That's why he could declare in John 14, 6, uh, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So many times we pull up from God and don't seek closeness with him because we know our walk has not been perfect. But grace draws us close to God because grace reminds us that even though we're not perfect, God still loves us. Even though we're not perfect, God loves us. Grace reminds us that even though we fall short of God's glory, time and time again, God still loves us. That's how grace works. Grace does not require anything from us. And that's a good thing because we have nothing to offer. The only requirement of God's grace is that we receive it with faith. Ephesians 2 and 8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Jesus brought the grace of God into our lives to provide our salvation. But he brought more than that. As important as grace is, Jesus brought something to the lives of men, women, boys, and girls that's just as vital as grace. Look at the text again, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only God of the Father, full of grace and truth. We can draw close to God because through Jesus, Jesus came to bring truth. Jesus came in to bring truth into our lives. The truth is that we all need God in life, and that's the truth. Jesus brings the truth of God into our lives in such a powerful way that it changes the way we look at our situation. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent with us. In this world of desertion and loneliness, he came down to say to us, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent with us. In the world of deception and deceit, he came down to say to, to us, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent with us. In the world of rejection and exploitation, he came out to say to us, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent with us. In this world of death and destruction, he came to say to us, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. He was not afraid to put on human flesh. Even though he knew that they would drive nails into his hands and his feet and hang him on a tree to die, he came down and pitched his tent with us so that we could live with him forever in the mansions of heaven. Be because he came down for us, we ought to be willing to go forth for him. We ought to go out from this place and tell the world about the great Savior that we have. We ought to go tell the world how he came down for us when we were lonely. We ought to go and tell the world how he came and fed us when we were hungry. We ought to go and tell the world how he picked us up when we were tired and weary. We ought to go and tell the world how he found us when we were lost. And most of all, we ought to tell the Lord how much we appreciate him coming down to see about us. We ought to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You found me when I was lost. You picked me up when I was weak and weary. You saved me, Lord, from eternal damnation. You put my feet on the right path. And the more we start praising the Lord, the more we appreciate the great sacrifice he made for us. We need to show our, our, our appreciation by the lives that we live. 
If we appreciate what we did, it will show up in the way that we live. If we appreciate the Lord coming down to preach his tent with us, it will show up in our lives. And Jesus spent time with his disciples. And when he was gone, even the enemies testified that they could tell that they had been with Jesus. If, he is, if you have spent time in tent with the Lord, it should show up in your life. If you have tent time with God, you should be anxious to tell the world about your time with God. Now, if the current president called and asked if he could stop by you and see you, you might rightly be suspicious. But if Barack Obama called and, and wanted to stop by your house, you would tell all your friends, you would put out signs that the former president slept here. You'd have selfies all over Facebook to celebrate your con connection with the powerful. The Prince of Heaven has invaded your space, and you, sh you should want to go tell the world about that. So now we return to the question with which we start. How does the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago affect how we live today? When we appreciate the life that the coming of Jesus made possible for us, we will live each day trying to glorify God with our lives. When we appreciate the light that Christ has brought into the darkness of our lives, we live each day the way that the, in a way that the light of our lives will shine to the lives of others, and God will be glorified. When we begin to appreciate the fact that love and grace prompted God to allow Jesus to come down and pay the price for our sins, we will glorify his name with every breath that we take. When we appreciate the fact that Jesus made possible, well, made the glory that, that Christ made possible for all who trust in him, we will thank God every day of our waking hour. Every day of our lives, if we appreciate and understand the truth of God, which has been revealed by Christ's coming, we will dedicate our lives to living the truth. Don't you want to live in the life that Jesus has given to you? Don't you want to live in the grace that Jesus has provided for us? For you, don't you want to live in the glory and the truth that Jesus has made possible for your life? I want to live in the light and the grace and the mercy and the truth of Jesus. That's what I'm planning to do. What about you? What about you? Let's stand out the choir leaders in song.